So as a literalist, we've got to ask you about Pablo Escobar, because you point <laughs> out that, well, he, he, he Pablo. committed. Yeah, Pablo, Don Pablo. That is the, the Spanish term Don before name means affectionate. We revere you. So how did this guy who killed thousands of people, could be thousands, we don't even know, countless people, and who was basically moving 80% at one point of the world's cocaine trade out of Colombia. How did this guy come to be so revered? Now we know he donated money for stadiums and parks and apartment complexes. And people came to see him as this Robin Hood of Colombia. Now you say the state is a kind of uh, Pablo Escobar. It appeals to the same moral psychology where we take someone who's committed some great crimes and yet we 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 shower them with with affection so uh why are we so morally weak or compromised and what what has the state done to earn this analogy in your literal opinion as the pablo escobar yeah great question i mean i, I wrote this essay after i saw the pablo escobar movie and then i started reading more about him well, living in the U.S., you don't hear about Pablo Escobar being a hero anywhere. But yeah, like in his hometown, he is still revered. There were like tens of thousands of people who came to his funeral. Like, why do people like this murderous jerk? And the answer is that he was extremely charitable. He really did give a lot of money to charity, very publicly, made a big deal out of it. And it's been striking. So it's not like the people that like him are likely to deny that he killed anybody. It's like, all right, fine. He did go and murder some journalists, whatever. But see, but but it's complicated. It's complicated because he also was very charitable. And to me, this is really striking. It's like, so I can like murder thousands of people, but if I'm also charitable, then I'm no longer clearly a bad guy. And you can just say, well, I actually love this guy. You know, he's got you know, some problems. He's not perfect. You Who become is? not Brian, but Don Brian. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Don Brian sounds pretty good. Right. So anyway, you, you know, I was just thinking about this and saying, huh, this is kind of an interesting pattern because I already knew there was other work on how groups like Hamas in Gaza get their start in philanthropy. You don't go and to the streets and say, hey, we want to go and establish a brutal dictatorship where we have the power of life and death and we do whatever we want. Instead, like a much better way of starting and making friends and is to go and to start you're digging some wells and setting up free schools for poor kids. This is a standard tactic that you'll see that political groups engage in. It's a way that you go and you give, and then people, people fall in love with you. And then when you start murdering people, some of them will just say, yeah, great. And others like, well, it's complicated. So anyway, uh, this, this Pablo Escobar story made me realize it is pretty striking that you know, all governments are minimum capable of waging, war, of waging war. Normally, they actually have waged multiple wars, uh, usually not all that scrupulously. You know, like if you want to win, well, this is war. You go and start killing people and like, you know, there's collateral damage or whatever. Well, you know, that's uh, unfortunate, but we're not going to worry about that until we have total victory. So totally standard for governments to go and be the repositories of organized violence. But it's also very standard for them to be involved in helping the poor and, other, and have charitable programs, the welfare state. And when I was just dwelling on this and saying, huh, so what does this probably do to the way that we feel about governments? If all governments did was to engage in warfare, a lot of it of dubious morality, then probably we would look at governments with a lot of negativity. But well, governments also do a bunch of other stuff that if they were Pablo Escobar would get them fans and affection and love and sympathy and excuses and apologists. And lo and behold, that's what actual governments do too. Mm. So I said, yeah, really, you know, you know like, like every government, even the ones you like, they go and they've killed a lot of innocent, innocent people. And like, so yeah, you've heard of Hiroshima and Nagasaki and Dresden, right? And the fire bombings and everything else. And it's like, well, uh, you know, like we were just killing guilty people. Like, yeah, every single person that you firebomb that burned alive was a Nazi. It's like, no, 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 well, they're guilty because they supported the government. Yeah, every person you killed and supported them. Probably most of them were just normal, apathetic people who are stuck in a bad situation. But even if you're going to so to draw a line in the sand there, all right, the babies. All right, you burn babies alive. Uh, how do you justify that? You say, well, like, 
it's unfortunate, but there's no other way to win. Uh, all right, you can do, you'd say stuff like this, but uh, my point is that the welfare state is the kind of thing that makes people a lot more willing to accept what are often pretty lame excuses for horrible behavior. So you say you're scared of Mormons, but not just Mormons, actually every group. So Christians, Hindus, Muslims, Jews, Indians, Latinos, there's no group you're unafraid of because these groups, if they get too much power, can use that power against others oppressively. So you're in favor of a balance of power. Now, intuitively, that makes sense. There is one group, it's worth noting, that is said to have a monopoly of power. That would be the government. Tell us what a balance of power looks like. In other words, if you could paint a picture of a society that more or less resembles this balance of power you envision, how would that work? All right. Um, just to back up. Yes, yeah, so like you know, I love Mormons. I've had Mormon friends for from for a young age. I was in a Mormon Cub Scout troop. I'm Jewish and I love Jews, but let me tell you, I'm scared of some of them too. It's okay to be scared. Yeah, yeah. I've never met a scary Mormon actually. Uh, <laughs> I mean, the point that I make in that essay is actually, even though they seem to be about the nicest people I've ever met, still I would be worried if they got up to 100 percent of the, you know, 99 percent of the population. Then I think that a lot of their niceness would go away in favor of being quite oppressive. Mm -hmm. right? And similarly, what I say in that piece is that I'm actually nervous about any one group in society getting a, get, get, getting this kind of monolithic control. I think that it is really better to have a division where no one group is able to really get their way. In that case, we wind up getting this modus vivendi where we do at least tend to do you know, go along to get along, live and let live, not always, but still, mm -hmm. uh, that is uh, you know, a lower risk setup. Now, in terms of you know, what is sort of the vision society where things are best, um, let's see. I don't have that many essays about this in uh, Voters as Man Scientists, Essays on Political Rationality, but I will stick my neck out and I've got another book coming out called Pro Market and Pro Business, uh, where I say, yeah, actually, the group that I trust the most and distrust the least out of all the major organizations I know is just business. Mm -hmm. And why? Yeah, well, experience. You look at business and, you know, business is the one group that reliably, I give them money and they give me things I like. Mm -hmm. right? And very rarely do they nag me. You know, you complain about Disney a bit or whatever, but the truth is business generally does very little nagging. They want to get your money. They give you what you want and they leave you alone. Right? That's standard practice in business. It still is overwhelmingly true, even if you can find some exceptions. Whereas government obviously doesn't work this way. Government doesn't go and say, hey, if something that you want, here's some money for it. Oh, yeah, would you want to go and pay us? Government normally says, give us money whether you like it or not. And then they give me stuff that I usually do not like. And I say most people don't really like what they're getting. How many people are actually thrilled with their public schools or whatever? It's like, well, they're okay, I guess. You share rightly the incredible value that the business world has brought us. We've got Amazon, the best store on planet Earth. And over the last 15 yeah. years, in all human history, there's never been a better thing than a better store than Amazon. I, I've never given nearly as much business to anyone. We have Skype, which is some futuristic thing that, that looks like it was out of a sci fi movie. It's free. Google, yeah. infinite knowledge about just about anything, free. You've got Uber for cheap rides anywhere, and the list goes on. But you also say the people who express concern around the loss of privacy, they don't really deserve to be taken too seriously. Now, correct. I, I'm curious, as you see things like social credit scoring starting to rear its head more, not in China where it's already entrenched, mm -hmm. but where you start to see things like, and by the way, social credit scoring is like, okay, your dog poops on the curb, or you say something that's out of vogue and seen by some people as not welcome, suddenly your social credit score gets punished. You might be excluded or locked out of certain restaurants or your housing complex or your wallet, right? So do you think that something like social credit scoring could actually ever come to America? 
I would say that the kind to worry about is precisely the government sponsored sort where they are forcing people to report and forcing people to use it and the government using it itself. A government's obviously a monopoly. And so if it gets that kind of power in its hands, yeah, you should be afraid. But I will say that your business is going and getting information on you is not the kind of thing that any sensible person worries about. And in fact, I just deny that people really do worry about it. The number of people actually stop oh, using yeah. their valuable business. Yeah. yeah the, the number of people actually stop using like any business they like because they're recording information on them. Almost mm -hmm. nobody. Uh, there actually are experiments with things like if I can use your information to get a $1 coupon and then people, yeah, sure, fine, whatever. Because who cares anyway? Normally businesses are collecting this information for big data. They're not planning on doing anything with you about it. In terms of credit uh, credit ratings in general, like we already have credit rating systems, which have some obvious functions like, well, what kind of interest rate do I want to give you on a loan or do I want to give you a credit card? It depends upon your past record, which I say is an eminently sensible system, much better than one where everybody can go and uh, where everyone gets treated as if they're a stranger. Well, you know, the reason why people want to lend you money is because you're not a stranger. If you really are a total stranger, then like, who would want to go and lend you something if they can't even find out who you are, whether you're going to pay it back. On terms of this getting out of hand, yeah, I just see very little reason to worry about it. The normal thing that businesses do is say, we will like, come one, come all. I mean, mall, you know, so like, you know, like there are some people say, oh, it's government that's preserving a quality of access. So normally this is you know, this not true, right? So if you take a look at a mall, you know, like, there are some legal things malls would get in trouble for if malls started trying to discriminate based upon race or something like that, they'd get in trouble legally. But there are so many other things that malls could legally do in order to change the change their customers and they don't even try because it's just bad business. They could say you have to you can only come to our mall if you're wearing a suit. There's a dress code here. Totally legal. You wouldn't get in any trouble for it. And yet it's basically never done. Mm -hmm. you know, restaurants, you know, I know like around the world, there are a few, there's, you know, like the U.S. is unusually casual. Uh, mm -hmm. Like in other countries, you're more likely to have a restaurant go and hassle you for wearing shorts or something like that. Even that's pretty rare I found in Europe these days. But in the U.S., like the number of restaurants where they make the slightest effort to tell you how to dress, it's pretty much zero. When I first started going to operas in Europe, I was like, oh, is there a dress code? And they're like, they're so grateful to get anyone to actually show up at the opera ah. if, was, if they're under 70 years old that... You no, know, no one's going to make any comments about your clothing. You just they sell you a ticket and you walk in dressed as a tourist slob at the Vienna, Vienna Opera or whatever. Um, so, yeah, I'd say that in general, business is super happy to go and take almost anybody's money. When you see that business is doing otherwise, I see normally this is actually under thinly veiled pressure from the government. Um, in particular, actually, um, you know, in my, you know, so in my last book, I talk about this more. Uh, when people talk about you know, getting you know, like you know, being worried about what they say on the job and getting in trouble for that, I say this is actually almost entirely due to civil rights law. You know, how so? Well, if the U.S. government would have passed a law saying that no one is allowed to make any sexist or racist comments on the job, the Supreme Court would throw that, that out in an instance. But if you first put in civil rights laws and then you get some court cases saying that you can sue someone if they allow employees to say racist and sexist things, that turns out to be totally constitutional. Mm -hmm. right? and so I say that actually what people think of as businesses going and engage in censorship of their employees is largely actually them just trying to protect themselves against lawsuits. And those mm -hmm. lawsuits are things that are at, that were created by the government. I mean, what's pretty striking is there's basically no major business that goes beyond the letter of the law for any of this stuff. You can imagine a business that says we care about racism so much that whatever, whatever amount of money we lose in a discrimination lawsuit, we'll double it. <laughs> like they say, or they'll say, look, if we're ever accused, we'll just immediately admit guilt and give you the money. No major corporation does that. They, give, they do the bare, the bare minimum the law makes them do, and then they try to go and make some lemonade out of lemons by saying, oh, we care about this so much. We're really diverse. We're really inclusive. But again, I'd say actually, while people like, like people imagine that this is – Primarily businesses have gone woke and they really want to do this stuff. They're run by fanatics. I say look, mostly they're still they're run by people who want to make money, but they're in an impossible situation where if they look the other way in the face of free speech, they are at risk they risk getting sued. And so it's really the government and not business that is the main reason why this is going on. 
So yeah, I mean, the kind of social credit scoring to worry about is one that is imposed by the government and the other stuff is generally reasonable and not something that a reasonable person worries about. You clearly developed your ideas, not through indoctrination, because you don't get these ideas in the school system that you've traveled through. Uh, no. <laughs> right. Um, and it begs the question, right? The education that everyone does travel through, formal education system, people say, and they justify it because it teaches us not just what to think, but how to think. <laughs> Do you believe that this grand system, the formal education system actually teaches us how to think? I mean, I would say it's not a question of what I believe. It's a question of what anyone who's ever seriously studied the question is actually able to find. Uh, there's a whole field that studies this question of teaching how to think. It's called educational psychology. It's been around for over a century. Normally, people go into this field because they, really, they earnestly believe there is such a thing as learning how to think, and they think that it's already going on. Right. You don't go into educational psychology because you're pessimistic about education. You go in because you're optimistic about education. And yet the punchline of over a hundred years of, of actual experimental research on learning how to think is that it hardly ever occurs. I would say that there's really two main positions in educational psychology on this learning how to think question, which they usually call transfer of learning. So if you want to go to Google Scholar and check what I'm saying, put in transfer of learning, which is the technical phrase that they use for learning how to learn or learning how to think. But anyway, uh, the, 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 the dominant position is that there's, they haven't been able to find much of anything that works. People normally learn exactly what you teach them, if that. That's the optimistic scenario is they actually learn what you teach, but people are very bad at applying things to any broader situation unless you go and hold their hands and tell them. And then there is a minority of people who say, oh, the systems that we have don't work, but I've got a magic bullet. I've got a silver bullet. I figured out a way to do it. So there are definitely some educational psychologists who say, I figured out how to teach people how to think. Here's how you do it. Um, the striking thing to me is each of these people is a lone voice in the wilderness because they haven't even convinced each other, much less the broader profession. Maybe one of them is right, but I'm skeptical. Um, now, what kind of experiments are we talking about? Normally, they're things along the lines of you teach people a problem-solving method and that, uh, that is suitable for, for other areas, and then you see whether they'll apply it. Could be as simple as you teach them the Pythagorean theorem, and then you give them a problem where they have to go and cut some wood, where the Pythagorean theorem is relevant. And normally in the experiment, you do it in, the, in a very leading the witness kind of way where you say, this is the Pythagorean theorem. It is a way that we can go and use to figure out the length of hypotenuse given our knowledge of the lengths of two other sides. And then next part is now, Here's a word working problem where you need to figure out a the length of a diagonal. What are you going to do? And what almost everyone on earth will do right after they get their Pythagorean theorem lesson is take out their tape measure and measure the diagonal. They don't use the Pythagorean theorem. But there's a lot of experiments along those lines where people just don't apply what they learned even an hour before. And then if you want to go and say, oh, people are going to use it decades later, like that's just not the way that it works. In the real world, learning is highly specific. Professors and teachers wish it were otherwise, but wishing don't make it so. What do we misunderstand about child labor? Yeah, so in my book, The Case Against, the Case Against Education, I do have a section, believe, I believe, called In Praise of Child Labor. And this is where I say, look, there's child labor and child labor. There's the stuff that we think of where like, you have kids doing chimneys, working mines, and I don't have anything good to say about that. Mm -hmm. But... What about just letting, letting kids go and get prepared for the real world by working a few hours a week? What's wrong with that? Right? And I say, like, not always nothing wrong with it. It seems like there's obvious benefits. In particular, even if the kid doesn't like it, there's the point of it's still giving you useful life lessons, preparing you. Even Maybe you'll work in that exact job. Even if you don't, though, you're learning general skills about how to deal with customers, how to, how to go and be part of a team. Very useful. And in my book, I then go and quote a paper where the person points out that in the 19th century, defenders of child labor would basically use the same arguments that we use in favor of school today. All right, it's not exactly fun. Kids usually don't exactly like it, but it's necessary for their future. It's helpful for their future. So it's a good thing for it to happen. And I have the same view of kids working in almost all jobs. Look, there's some jobs that are not really good for kids, obviously. 
But I say in both cases, the people that I trust to make these decisions are parents. We let parents go and take their kids to dangerous countries. We let parents go and sign for their kids to engage in dangerous hobbies. So as to why we shouldn't just rely upon parents to decide whether a job is or is not suitable for their kids. I don't think there is a good answer to that other than just some kind of hostility to markets and markets in general and business in mm -hmm. general. We've covered good ground here. One more topic to get to from your book, Voter Says Mad Scientist, is a misperception we carry around about those who are politically on the left versus those who are politically on the right. What misperception do we hold? I've heard a lot of people give their big stories about, well, the left is like this and the right is like that. And all the stories just seem wrong to me, pretty obviously wrong. And then I said, so what is the right story? And it's like, well, you're not going to come with any sort with any simple slogan that fits everybody on the left or everybody on the right because they're just too diverse. But if you wanted to come up with the best simple story that gives a very good, accurate description of left versus right all over the world for the last 200 years, what would it be? And my simple, uh, my simplistic theory is this. The left is anti-market, the right is anti-left. The left is anti-market, the right is anti-left. People often mishear this as hates markets, hates the left. Well, that's too strong because there's different levels of intensity. But the way I think about it is this. If you just imagine having a grand convention, we're going to go and use time travel to go and bring together all the main leftists from the last 200 years all over the world into one big place and then say, all right, get together and write a position paper where 80% of you will agree with it. And similarly, we'll get all the right wingers from all over the world for the last 200 years. You guys write down a position paper that 80% of you can agree with, right? What will it say? And I say what the left wing compromise paper will be is a bunch of complaints about markets and the right wing compromise paper will be a bunch of complaints about the left. That's mm -hmm. what the people agree on. Especially a lot of leftists will say, no, 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 no. Maybe left is anti-market, the right is pro-market. And I say, no, 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 no. There are a lot of anti-market right wingers. Mussolini started off as, the, as the, uh, the head of the Socialist Party in Italy. He was very anti-market his whole life. But what, he, where he, what made him a right-winger, what does make him a right-winger is he came to hate the left. And mm -hmm. then he waged war against them right, and uh, stamped them out in Italy. Uh, he was very anti-market. There's a lot of right-wingers who are anti-Walmart or right-wingers who don't like a lot of businesses. Right? There's right-wingers who say small is beautiful. Right? It's definitely a part of the right-wing coalition. What do they have in common with Milton Friedman? I say not liking those guys, not liking the left. That's what they can agree on. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, now, uh, there's a lot of other stories, and I just say like the other ones just don't fit the facts. Mine is sort of deflationary. It's not, it doesn't uh, describe a lot of detail. Some people say, oh, well, does this explain what Trump? And I'll say, well, given that Trump just happened a few years ago, no, it doesn't really explain Trump. Right? I'll say like it's sort of consistent with my story, but it's just a little bit of extra evidence in favor of B. And I would say the real evidence is just we got 200 years of world history. And that's where I claim that's what's really backing me up here. Why then are vocational schools more popular elsewhere in the world if it seems like they would give you a more practical onboarding into the business world or, or the working world. But here in the US, it seems like they're so lowly valued by society and students. Hmm. You know, I would say that you know, most of that is what government, what government wants to support. So that's the main thing. So yeah, like if you have to come up, come up with the money out of your own pocket, it's going to be a lot smaller than if government says, don't want to do regular high school, we'll pay for vocational instead. So that's the really obvious thing. Now, once you have a system like this, then if a lot of people are doing it, then the stigma is going to be less. So there's a stigma against vocational education. Why did you do the thing that is intellectually easier right now? Of course, you might say, well, like it's maybe it's not intellectually easier. You know, like there is the basic fact that even in countries, with a lot of vocational education, the smartest, most ambitious people don't want to do it. They want to do something else normally. Right. Mm -hmm. So there's that. So I do think you have like, if you're going to be honest, you're going to, have to say, well, the you know, people that do vocational education, they're sending a worse signal than people that are doing the academic track normally. But in terms of useful skills, I would say vocational education is giving more useful skills. Uh, now, in the case against, educa uh, case against education, I go on and I say, well, look, vocational education is definitely sending a better signal than dropping out. And for the kind of people that do vocational education in uh, most countries, 
if they had no other option than vocation, uh, you know, than academic, or there would just be much more dropping out. So in the U.S., where we really don't have a big vocational option, then we just see, especially a lot of young men, just drop out of high school. Whereas mm. in Germany and Switzerland, those guys would have been funneled into the auto factory or plumbing apprenticeship or something like that, which I say is obviously way better. Especially remember the probability of male high school dropouts ending up in jail, which is crazy high. So if we can now at least acknowledge that the, the extent to which government is involved in schooling is not so desirable, we've seen a separation between church and state. Mm -hmm. Could we realistically expect ever a separation between school and state? And if so, when? And what might precipitate that? Hmm. Well, I would say that we've got an answer, which is that COVID has precipitated a big uh, increase in the separation of school and state because school choice is actually starting to pass in a lot of states. So mm -hmm. basically there are a few years when public school unions decided that they should receive full pay to not do their jobs at all, right? Because I don't consider going and teaching over Zoom to be doing their jobs. Their jobs are to provide daycare first and foremost. And then maybe you teach students something and they didn't do that. So they say, oh, we should get paid to not do our jobs, right? And this actually did get taxpayers angry enough to start getting supportive of school choice programs. You see, probably a secondary factor was the inten intensification of left-wing indoctrination in schools, the wokeness that also antagonized a lot of parents. So many of these two things have created a perfect storm where finally we were getting school choice which is not full separation of school and state, obviously. It's more like the German system where you can choose any church you want and whichever one you want determines where the government goes and pays the religious subsidy. But at mm -hmm. least it is an improvement over everyone is presumed to belong to the same church and that church gets supported by the government. So we move in that direction. I think that we're gonna keep moving this direction for a few more years. There's just a lot of parents who are sick of the status quo and a lot of politicians who say, hey, I can actually get some hay out of this. I think, again, especially in red states, they're realizing why should we go? Why should we go and keep giving piles of free money to this occupation that very dis that dislikes us and keeps trying to go and brainwash our students to hate us? Mm -hmm. I don't think it's an exaggeration. I think if you do go and look at the curriculum in a lot of public schools, even in red states, the left wing bias is so overwhelming now that I think you'd be sort of crazy as a Republican legislator to go and support your local public schools. Don't support them. Those people hate you and are trying to teach kids to hate you. So uh, do whatever you can to go and gut that system just in your own political self-interest. As I said, I think that the main error they're making is in thinking that schools are all that effective at indoctrinating people. Most teachers are so freaking boring that even when you give them a year to go and brainwash their students, they don't succeed. The students are, you know, they, they may be going systemic racism, blah, blah, blah. The students mean more checking their phones and watching TikTok videos. So the world, you know, things are not as bad as you seem, but it's not because not for want of left wing fanaticism in the curriculum. It's for lack of follow through and just sheer attention to wanting to persuade people. Most mm. professors are incredibly boring too. Even if they are trying to brainwash their students, they're doing a very poor job of it. You talk about how students who are seeking an education are actually more than an education seeking signals because an education doesn't just signal brain power uh, or work ethic, it signals compliance. Tell us when people pursue an education, what you think they are really after. I would say actually that my thesis here is one that normal audiences accept. Mm -hmm. Almost all of my work is very controversial when I try selling it to a random audience, normally I just get a bunch of weird looks. When I talk about education, this is the one thing I can talk about where people are nodding along with me for most of the talk. Mm -hmm. uh, just to back up. Uh, I say though the real quest that people are pursuing is to get a good job. I think that's mm -hmm. the main reason why people go to school. If schools couldn't offer you that, I think there'd hardly, there'd hardly be any people here. Mm -hmm. Right now, uh, how does school help you to get a better job? The obvious route, which is not completely wrong, is they give you some they give you some training. They teach you how to do things you're going to need to do in the jobs. So when you show up on the job, you know what you're doing. I say, but this doesn't explain the fact that most of what you study in school, you're never going to lose again on any job. What job are you going to use history on or foreign language in America or art or music? You know, most, most jobs, you don't need to use most of the stuff that you actually do in school. 
And yet, if you had failed all those subjects, you probably wouldn't be able to get the job, right? You wouldn't have the degrees. So then I say, so then what is the main thing that we're getting out of school if it's not mostly job training? So the main thing is what you call a signal, which is another word for certification or stamping, right? It's a way that you, are, you get graded by your school. Literally, they give you grades, which mm -hmm. then serves as information for employers as to who is worth at least giving an interview to and who you should throw their application in the trash. So this is my big story about the main thing that education does. It's mostly a way for people to convince the world that they are worth hiring. Uh, the slogan that I have is we usually think of education as being job training, whereas really it is mostly a passport to the real training, which happens on the job. Right now, what does this mean for online education? Well, like you said, the question is, all right, well, if I'm signaling something, what am I signaling or what are the, what are schools certify? Partly to signify your sheer brains. You can meet someone from MIT and you're like, all right, that guy's smart. But you also probably know people that are smart, but still do poorly in school. What, what, what holds them back? Well, one big thing is lack of work ethic. Yes. Why we all know smart, lazy people and they struggle in school. But as they finally, the thing that really cements the system and locks it in place is what you call compliance, what I call conformity. We know people that are smart and hardworking and still struggle in school because they are nonconformist, right? And actually, you know, um, you know me, I'm a non, I'm a nonconformist. I'm not a pathological nonconformist though. I'm someone where someone asked me to do something stupid and my reaction is, can I get away with not doing it? What happens if I don't? And then if the answer is then you don't get to be a professor. Okay, fine. I'll do your stupid thing. All right. But on the other hand, if it's, oh, well then strangers will think less of you. Fine. I'll wear shorts and let the strangers think less of me. That's my level of nonconformity. But anyway, there's no I in team. It is totally reasonable for employers to want conformist employees for most purposes. The problem with conformity signaling is that once you've got a system in place that signals conformity, it's very hard to break out of it. Because if someone says, I have a new revolutionary way to signal your abject conformity, well, who are going to be the first people in line to go and try this radical revolutionary new signal conformity? It's probably going to be nonconformists. So you're in a catch 22. And I say this is the main problem with online education is that the first people in line to go and do it, especially before COVID, are going to be nonconformists who don't want to go and do the normal thing. COVID actually did give a boost because it made it temporarily the normal thing. Even there, still, uh, as we're returning, people generally are we were putting more value on the in person part or like, well, we'll give a little bit of online. We're not going to make the whole thing online. Uh, but anyway. Uh, if the only reason to go to school were to learn, then I would say that online is as good or better than regular education. So if that were the correct story, then online would have already won a long time ago. Mm -hmm. So I say the fact that online is not one shows there's something else going on. And I propose that something else that's going on is signaling, specifically the conformity signaling, which is why when you look at paintings of what college was like 800 years ago, the University of Paris 800 years ago, it almost looks exactly like the way it does now. Sage on the stage, bunch of students taking notes. We get into, in my personal experience, uh, a basic public school education where I was oblivious. I found out after the fact that my books were very biased. My history book, um, I, I was kind of shipped off to the UN as part of some climate initiative. I had no idea the UN was a political organization or what the politics were. I was like 13 years old, <laughs> right? And, and so it would seem that at least competition in some way, shape or form would be healthy. Homeschooling being one alternative. Um, but then there's some parts of the world where what you call uh, compulsory enlightenment, right? Government funded, government subsidized schools. Um, are the only way homeschooling is prohibited. What do you have to say about that? Right. I mean, of course, homeschooling is an option for minority, like, you know, like except during COVID. During COVID, I just said, told everyone, everyone should homeschool now. Zoom school is a joke. You're going to have to go and take a pile of time to either monitor your kid or teach them. Just teach them yourself. It's easier and better. Mm -hmm. Right. So that's the mm -hmm. one time that I became like a true homeschooling fanatic and just told everyone to do it. Look, I'm a practical person. I understand that it's not for everybody, but as an alternative for, you know, as one option among many, the idea that it's somehow bad or like, like you know, worse than the alternative seems pretty crazy, especially when you know how bad a lot of public schools are. Um, mm -hmm. But the question of compulsory enlightenment, this is a little bit different. This is the question of, 
is it a good idea to go and say, look, opera's really good, so we're, we're going to go and try to make everyone lo lo appreciate opera. Shakespeare's really good. We're going to make everyone study Shakespeare. Uh, this is one where you could go and just say philosophically I have a problem with it. But as a social scientist, I say, well, let's leave that aside and just say, does it work? Does it work? It has been standard for U.S. high schools to try to go and force feed Shakespeare to students on the theory that they won't do it on their own and it's really great. So if we just make them do it, they'll come to love it. All right, fine. What is the evidence that we have successfully made students come to, uh, students come to love Shakespeare? Well, there we can just go and take a look at book sales of Shakespeare plays or downloads or number of hits for Shakespeare plays online. And we can see, wow, hardly anyone voluntarily reads Shakespeare. There's only, we have not successfully actually gotten people to like Shakespeare. There's a lot of classical music indoctrination in schools, at least there was when I was a kid. Hardly anyone likes classical music. Just going down the list. So is it like, like regardless of whether you think that it is wrong in principle, in practice, it just, it just has not worked to more than a middle school degree. And a particular standard I use is suppose that we ascribe 100% of all opera appreciation, say, to public schools. Mm -hmm. Well, in that case, we have achieved approximately nothing because hardly anybody likes opera. Right. And I say this as an opera fanatic, but I'll just say, look, it is just not true that you have managed to make people like it. Uh, and so, you know, a lot of this is part of my general policy of saying, don't give schools credit for their good intentions, judge them by their actual results. Don't let them say we try to teach people how to think and then assume that they succeed. The evidence says they don't. Don't let them say we're trying to go and expose people to the, rich, uh, to the richness of life and make them appreciate the really good things and assume that they succeed. They don't. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we've seen... That's in very rare cases, of course, but mm -hmm. not very mm -hmm. often. Doesn't make sense to go and bother everybody for the <clears> sake <throat> of a very tiny number of people and spend a pile of money to get almost nothing. Thank you for joining this episode of The CEO Show. Please subscribe and hit that notification bell so you don't miss upcoming episodes where I will do my level best to help you unlock greater success and freedom. And share this video. You and everything you do makes a difference.